And welcome. It's Monday, 1 o'clock, time for Deal Doctor live stream. And today's topic is going to be if it isn't in writing, and yes, several of you got the correct answer, it doesn't exist. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the um, shortcomings of uh, the forms we use and how to um, fix that. So, but first of all, I want to talk about EMDs, uh, earnest money deposits. Again, uh, we're still getting questions, comments, circumstances um, where EMDs are, uh, first of all, some of them are not being collected. Um, if you have a buyer and you write an offer for that buyer, uh, you have to collect that earnest deposit uh, within the time frame which is specified in your purchase agreement. Now, for example, in the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement, it says within 72 hours of a fully executed contract. That means 72 hours, uh, calendar hours, calendar days, not uh, business days. So if you haven't collected that earnest deposit within that time frame, uh, then you have to tell the other agent you're not allowed to keep that as confidential information to the buyer because we are now on operating under escrow law when there is a reference in the purchase agreement that we are going to uh, take in a, a uh, earnest deposit and put it in our trust account then we are operating under escrow law and we have to abide by that law therefore if we don't get uh, the actual earnest deposit within the time frame that's specified in the contract, whatever contract you're using, then we have to report that to the other agent. Um, and I know that that's not being done. So uh, we have to be very careful because if you don't do that, let's just play, let's pretend for a moment. Uh, number one, you could have a, uh, a complaint filed against you in the with uh, Michigan licensing and regulation, uh, or you could get down to closing and the buyer decides that they get cold feet and they don't want to close and they walk away from the deal. Who's going to pay that earnest deposit? Probably the agent or five star uh, or a combination thereof, uh, but it's probably going to come back to the to the agent to pay that earnest deposit. <clears throat> that they had not collected and not informed anyone about. So be very careful. If it says you have to collect an earnest deposit, do it. And if you don't get it within the time frame, you have to inform uh, the other party. So the other thing we run into a lot with earnest deposits is the belief that we can simply release an earnest deposit for example, if an inspection doesn't uh, go well, buyer says, you know, within whatever period of time the contract calls for, let's say, for example, 10 days, on day eight, they say, you know what, I don't think I want to buy this house, I don't like the way the roof looks, whatever the, whatever the reason. First of all, the inspection has to be performed. The buyer on the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement can perform it, but again, you have to understand each of your contracts is a little bit different as it regards inspections. So let's say that the buyer within the terms of the contract uh, and the inspection clause, they decide, well, we don't want the house and so we're going to kill the deal. Five Star cannot simply go, okay, we're going to give the buyer the money back. Because if it's disputed by that seller, if the seller says, hey, wait a minute, I operated in good faith. I went out and had, a, had uh, my, my septic uh, system repaired, the air conditioning, new furnace, new roof, whatever. I feel as though I'm entitled to the money because of the money that I expended during the process. So they dispute the earnest deposit. Now, bear in mind that at no time was there an addendum changing the terms of the contract from being contingent upon this, the uh, ability of the, the buyer's ability to get financing, that remained steady through the whole thing, through extensions and so on. But now the seller is saying, I want to dispute the earnest deposit. Well, that's their right. It's the buyer's right 
to claim the earnest deposit in this case as well. Five Star's job at that point, because we operate under escrow law, is to step back and say, we can't adjudicate this. We can't be the judge and jury and enforce our opinion here. Because, for example, if we give it to the buyer and the seller wins in a court case, then Five Star is going to be the one who's going to pay it. And that's not going to happen. So if we... Uh, again, operating under escrow law, the only way that we can release that money is to have either a mutual release signed by both parties um, or a judgment from a court. It's that simple. We just can't, say, somebody just can't say, well, you know, the, the broker can step in and make a decision. Well, we can't because of the escrow law. It puts us at great risk. Um, and so as a policy, we don't. So when you get in that situation, certainly call us. Uh, we'll help you work through it. Um, but uh, ultimately, if there's a dispute, it's going to come down between the buyers and the sellers, and the escrow money is going to sit there until uh, it's determined where it belongs uh, uh, according to a court or a mutual release. I hope I made that clear. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> One of the biggest, most frequent areas of confusion is regarding inspections. Um, some of it is in regard to the structural inspection, plumbing, heating, electrical, and so on. But again, we have to read the contracts to understand what the ramifications are for each of those contracts, whether we're working in Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, Traverse City, Jackson, all of those things. They're, they're all a little bit different. So, um, for example, in the Grand Rapids area and Muskegon area, uh, buyers have the right to do their own inspections. And I believe in one of the areas that we work in here, I'm trying to find it real quick, um, for example, um, in Kalamazoo, it's a little bit unclear to me. It says, buyer acknowledges that buyer has been advised to carefully evaluate the property to determine its condition and suitability for buyer's intended use. Buyer is aware that inspector, inspectors and inspection services are available to aid the buyer in these evaluations. Kim Anderson, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but in reading this, it doesn't say that the buyer can't do their own inspections. It just says that they have been advised that there are inspection services available. Um, again, Kim, you know this be market better than I do. So if, uh, if you have something to add there, please, by all means, do. Um, in that course, there is also a difference in the GCAR form versus the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement, for example, in how, what happens when the inspections come back. Um, they in the Grand Rapids area and in Muskegon and so on, the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement, we don't have to provide a reason. We don't have to say that there were termites in the basement or that there was uh, bad electrical or bad furnace. We can simply say, buyer hereby terminates the offer based on inspections. Simple as that. Now, under GCAR, it's a little bit different. It says, that they uh, have to provide any applicable documentation or reports and any applicable written cost estimates along with any uh, request for correction or repair. So again, whenever you're working with a, the repair, the structural, uh, electrical, heating, and so on, um, it's very, very important that you understand 
how your particular area works per the contract, um, not based on uh, past assumptions. Which brings us to a the one that we get the most frequent calls on is well and septic inspections. Again, I've got I just pulled up like four different uh, purchase agreements here, and every one is slightly different. The one I like best, frankly, is the one, the job that Jackson uh, area does regarding well and septic inspections, and it has little check boxes. Uh, it says, uh, is it connected to community water and sewer? Uh, buyer is going to furnish a report uh, regarding the water by a certified inspector, and so on and so forth. It's very clear, very simple. It doesn't leave any um, gray areas. But Tim, if you're watching and you disagree with me, by all means, let me know. Um, the point is, that's, that's pretty clear. It says that there's going to be a well and septic inspection if those boxes are checked. So with that, I will turn to the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement, the one many of us use. And this is where it gets really gray. It says, within 10 days after the effective date, the seller shall arrange for and pay for, at seller's expense, an inspection of the primary well and used for human consumption, including water, water quality tests and septic systems. The inspection will be performed by a qualified inspector in a manner that meets county or local government authority protocol. Seller will follow any governmental rules regarding pumping of tanks. Hmm. Where there is no county government uh, or pro uh, no county or government protocol is in place, seller will arrange and pay for a seller's expense well and septic inspections as referenced above and have the septic tanks pumped at the seller's expense. Now, for example, Kent County. Kent County does not have protocol. It does not require a well and septic inspection. Um, so, in that case, paragraph two says that you're going to have a well and septic inspection. It doesn't matter if it was inspected two weeks ago. It doesn't matter if it was inspected two, uh, six months ago, two years ago. None of that matters. What's in the contract, what's in writing, matters. There used to be a rule of thumb <clears throat> that uh, if it was pumped within two years, uh, it didn't need to be pumped again. That's not true. That's not what the purchase agreement says. So when you run into a situation where a seller says, well, I just had this done, uh, perform yeah, I just had this uh, performed or pumped uh, in February, let's say, um, you know, why do I need to have it pumped again? Well, because the contract calls for it. The contract doesn't say, unless it was pumped in February. It's as simple as that. So if you want to say that, if the seller wants to counter that and say that they will make the uh, well and septic report that was performed in February and the pump card that they received in February available to the buyer to satisfy the well and septic paragraph, fine. Then put it in there. Clarify it. Make sure that everybody understands that that well and septic is not going to be performed today, that the buyer is going to accept the one that was performed in February. That's where we run into a big, uh, a, a lot of problems. For example, Ottawa County does have protocol, very clear protocol. Number one, you have to have a well and septic performed um, whenever a property is transferred. Um, however, unless, the, and it has to be done by Ottawa County Sanitarian. Uh, not an independent contractor, an, an independent uh, sanitarian like you can in Kent County, for example. So, once that sanitarian makes a determination 
they will determine whether or not the pumps have to be tanked. <laughs> Tanks have to be pumped. I'm sorry, I always get that backwards. Anyway, they will determine whether or not the tanks have to be pumped. So, um, and then they have to abide by that because it says right there, the seller will also follow governmental rules regarding pumping of tanks, right in the contract. So, it's important that no matter where you list a property, whatever county, whatever township, you have to know what the pumping requirements are and what the protocol is, or if there is any, um, and make sure that both parties are understanding correctly uh, or the same about how this is going to be handled. For example, um, I know a lot of agents um, who make it a point to write down seller will uh, pump tanks uh, and have inspection and pump tanks for uh, well and septic, um, you know, after this fully executed purchase agreement. That nothing that happened before will count, even if it was done two weeks ago. Again, a seller may counter and say, hey, I just had it done two weeks ago. And if that's acceptable, then you put it in writing and make sure that all parties agree that that's going to be an acceptable uh, inspection report. Um, again, throwing a lot of paper around here today. This is the one that's done by the uh, Michigan Association of Realtors. Frankly, uh, it's an outdated form. Um, not really even sure why we're using this. Uh, we're going to have to check into this um, because it's it's being used by one of our uh, areas and it's from 1995. So we'll we'll look into this one further. Uh, but this one doesn't even really talk about well and septic inspections, except to say that they have the uh, buyer has the ability to have any and all inspections performed. I guess it would fall in there, uh, but generally, you can't get those done quite as quickly as a uh, another type of form. So, I would be a little bit cautious about that one. Again, if it isn't in writing, it doesn't exist. If you don't have an agreement about what's going to happen regarding an inspection. Uh, of the well and septic system and pumping of tanks, then it's probably not going to uh, be enforceable to, to have them pumped if there is protocol such as there is with Ottawa County. But if there is no protocol, the contract is very clear that you have to have them pump uh, the tanks inspected, the well inspected, and if the sanitarian determines that the pumps, the tanks have to be pumped, um, then you have to do it. Okay. Um, someday I'm going to get that phrase right. I don't know why. Okay. Um, now this is mostly for the West Michigan Regional Purchase Agreement. Uh, actually, it's, it's GRAR. It's a GRAR uh, new form. And Grar has decided to try to end the confusion regarding delayed listings, uh, delayed showings, delayed uh, presentation of offers, and it's called a request for showings and presentation of offers addendum to the listing contract, listing agreement. Now, this was sent out by Pam um, last week. Uh, Greg shared it with uh, with all of us, um, and it goes into effect uh, two days from now. So, if you are planning to have a listing that you are going to postpone showings on until, let's say, Sunday, this form needs to be included with the listing contract, um, and it's an effort to try to make it clear. And it does a pretty good job if you read through it carefully and understand what you're agreeing to, what your seller is agreeing to. Um, it's not to be confused with a delayed submission form. A delayed submission form is a different form 
which causes a property to not go live on the MLS until, let's say, two weeks or a month from now. That's a totally different form, totally separate from this. But if your objective is to take the listing now and get some carpeting, some photos, some staging done, and so on, and then have it go live a month from now, then use the delayed submission form. That's what that's for. But you can't market the property in any way, shape, or form. You can't put a sign on, you can't put it on Facebook, you can't hold an open house, and so on. Um, so I wanna be very clear that this form deals only with uh, the postponement of showings and the presentation of offers. And I'll just cover a couple of the options here. One is, as requests for showings of the property are received, the seller agrees and contents, consents to the following. One, effective immediately, private showings will be permitted within blank number of hours of advance notice to the seller. So if the seller wants 24 hours notice, they have a right to check that box and that those showings will occur as quickly as possible within that time frame, within the next you know day or so. The other option is private showings will not be permitted until after, let's say, one o'clock on the 28th, for example, uh, August 28th. Thereafter, 24 hours, for example, advance notice will be provided to the seller. So those are two boxes that you can check, which basically says either we're gonna start showing the property right now, or we're gonna hold off showings until, let's say Thursday, or when the open house occurs on Saturday or Sunday, for example. Now, as offers to purchase are received, the seller acknowledges that the listing broker and agent is obligated to present all offers objectively and as quickly as possible. Once presented, the seller may choose to accept, reject, counter, call for highest and best, or wait to determine if additional offers are presented. If choosing to wait, the seller understands that the offer in hand might be expire and become null and void. Read that carefully and understand it. What it's saying is that seller does not have any obligation whatsoever to accept your offer within the time frame that you have presented it. It's plain and simple. Now, a lot of people say, well, if I present a full price offer, I'm entitled to a commission. Well, good luck with that. In theory, that's supposed to be how it works, in a, and maybe in a slow market it would. But in order to do that, a buyer's agent would have to sue as a third-party beneficiary. And in order to do that, you have to go to the court, and courts take time. Uh, so by in during that time, let's say that they present an offer, uh, they are, the seller is presented an offer for half, just to be silly, uh, presented half of the amount that your offer was, and they accept it. Your lawsuit then becomes moot. It makes no difference because they ultimately did sell the property and pay a commission. So um, if you're going to go down that road, um, good luck. It's going to be a real, real tough road to go. Um, now, back to when offers are received. The seller also has the exception, the ability to accept this by Checking this box, the seller instructs the listing agent and broker not to submit offers as quickly as possible. In other words, they don't have to present them within 12 or 24 or 48 hours of the time they get them in their hand if they check this box. Instead, the seller directs listing agent to hold all offers until, let's say, oh, Monday or Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. In this event, seller and listing agent broker agree that the listing agent broker will not disclose any information or provide copies of any offers until the date and time identified herein. This process makes certain that the information, to pub uh, information published to cooperating brokers will be honored and that all interested buyers will be aware of the time frame. 
uh, for submitting their highest and best offer. Seller and listing agent broker acknowledge the failure to abide by this process could result in a pro standards action. And then the seller and everybody is supposed to sign that. Okay. Now, here's the issue with this one that I have. Let's say that the seller agrees to not look at any other offers until next Tuesday. But one is written for $20,000 over the asking price and the, buy and the seller doesn't want to lose it by waiting to look at it until later. Well, by signing this, this is what we didn't have before, which we have now. By signing this, it eliminates our ability to accept that offer or even to review it um, because we're going to honor this contract. Can the seller say, well, wait a minute, we heard through the grapevine that that, thing was, that offer we got was crazy high and we want to change our minds. Um, yeah, you can probably change this, but be very, very careful because it puts you in a very dangerous position uh, to be called before the Pro Standards Committee. If you suddenly change this to Friday night, we're going to look at offers, and everybody else thinks that you're waiting until Tuesday to review offers, you suddenly go in and change that information, get an amendment to the listing contract signed, and then almost immediately accept a different offer. That's going to probably leave you open for a pro standards action. So use this form, explain the importance of um, honoring the contract uh, to the seller and keep it a level playing field or else you may find yourself in front of uh, your local board grievance committee or in front of Lara. So um, I hope that helps. Um, gave you some information today. And before I leave though, Dom, got any questions? Uh, Julie Reisner just had one last minute. She said, didn't Grar make a rule about this? GCAR hasn't yet. Make a rule about what? I'm not sure. You can just jump on and answer later. Okay. Yeah, Julie, I, um, I think that's what I just, I, that's what I covered right now that yes, Grar has, it goes into effect on August 26, that they have to have that form uh, in order, uh, included with the listing, in order to postpone showings and the re review of offers. If I hope that's what you're asking, and I'm that's the answer. If not, uh, please leave a note, and I'll get back to you on it. Okay. Thanks all for joining. It is uh, time for me to go. Thanks for visiting. See you next week.